the Hudson Library and Historical Society's Adult Program Series presents a special historical mystery novel presentation based in one of Cleveland's grand old bank buildings. Author D.M. Pulley speaking about her award-winning book, The Dead Key. Winner of the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award for 2014. Recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on October 27, 2015. Um, before we get started, I have a few announcements. We're going to do the talk and then we will adjourn to the rotunda. Refreshments, book signing. Books are being sold courtesy of the Learned Owl. Um, and I hope on your way to the reception, you take a look at the beautiful display in our vignette room to the left as you walk into the reception room. I want to um, extend a very big thank you to Linda and Bill Greaves. Are they here? <laughs> They're over here. Thank you very much. They donated their collect or not donated. They let us borrow um, for display their collection of blocks and keys, and they're beautiful. Please check them out. We put them in the vignette room in honor of this program tonight, and I mean, it's, it, nothing could be more fitting. So please check that out if you, if you do one thing tonight. Um, I also want to mention um, <coughs> November 11th, um, another Cleveland author, James Robinall, he will be coming and talking about his new book, January 1973. Um, and if you haven't heard of this book, it's about, um, in the span of one month, Watergate burglars went on trial, the Nixon administration negotiated an end to the Vietnam War, the Supreme Court issued its decision in Roe v. Wade, Lyndon Johnson passed away, and Richard Nixon was sworn in for a second term. He's going to talk about all of that and how this changed American history just in one month. Should be really interesting. And here, it reads like a thriller, too, so I have it, it's my next read on my nightstand. Um, so, for all of you mystery lovers, speaking of mystery lovers, we do have a new mystery lovers book club. So, we just started that last month. I, uh, obviously, all of you love books and mysteries, because you're here tonight. Um, so, we just started that. Next month, we'll be reading The Good Girl, um, and you can check those out at the circulation desk. We have copies available. Um, and finally, speaking of book clubs, we did choose The Dead Key for our first pick, for our first book choice for this new book club. Um, and we were talking about what was our favorite character, and someone ra raised her hand and she said, "My favorite character in the Dead Key was Cleveland and the bank." And just and I and I couldn't agree more. Um, and when you hear tonight um, from our lovely author, you'll understand why she really brings in a lot of the description about these banks. You really feel like you're as you as you all know if you've read it, you really feel like you're in these old banks. And that is because Ms. Pulley. Um, works as a professional engineer and spell engineer specializing in the rehabilitation of historic structures and forensic investigations of building failures. And she based this novel on a structural survey of an abandoned building, so she knows them very well. Um, she won the 2014 Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award Grand Prize for the Dead Key, and she said, what, 10,000 entries, and she won. Very impressive. work as a private consultant and forensic engineer. So please welcome Ms. Dean Pulley. Thank you so much. I hope you guys can all hear me. Is this still working volume wise? Okay, great. Thank you so much for coming out and thank you to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. What a beautiful venue and what a beautiful library. I've never been here before. Uh, my parents live nearby, and I'm going to make sure they come here again. And thank you to the Grieve family for that beautiful key display. I got a chance to see it, and it's the coolest thing. Ever since um, stumbling upon this mystery I'm about to tell you about, um, keys and me, I have a, a special love. Um, so please check it out when we're done tonight. But tonight, I wanted to take some time and tell you a little bit about me and how I went from being an engineer in Cleveland, Ohio, to having a book published by Amazon Publishing and getting to meet with you fine folks. It's been a bizarre and unusual journey, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I'm happy to answer questions, by the way, so if at any point you want to ask me something, just raise your hand, and there will be a question and answer period at the end also, so we'll try to keep it interesting. Uh, so I grew up 
in a, in a little town in Michigan. People always ask me which one, and I don't say, because, you know, um, I like to have some mystery about myself as well. But uh, it looked like this most of the time. Um, it looks like a lot of parts of Ohio you might recognize. Um, when I was young, I want to say there was maybe between five and ten busy intersections of my whole town, not that many traffic lights, and all the traffic lights would blink when the high school was playing football. Um, the entire town shut down. You could rob a bank in my town if the high schools were playing each other in football. And there wasn't a lot else to do. It was a very sweet, calm, quiet, boring, dull, safe place to grow up. And um, so this is me. I'd like to say that I was, you know, always an artistic writer, but actually I was a cheerleader too. And, you know, even the girls played football in my town. So this is sort of where I came from. And uh, thank goodness my parents filled my house with books because otherwise I probably would have gone crazy. Um, both my mom and dad are avid readers. And the house, when we moved them to Stowe a couple years back, moving the books was the biggest struggle, wouldn't you say, uh, for the whole move. I want to say my mother gave away something on the order of 3,000 books before moving, and we still had, oh God, at least 10 boxes of books that my parents wanted to bring with us. And so I grew up in a house full of books, and people always ask me what sort of books I like to read as a kid. Um, the answer to that question is the ones I probably wasn't supposed to read. I really loved those the best. I loved sneaking into my older sister's bedroom and stealing her books. Um, John Saul suffered the children with the dead, bleeding baby doll. Loved it. Um, I think I was maybe seven or eight when I picked that up off her shelf. Um, I read all sorts of things. My house was full of classics. It was also full of all kinds of fiction. V.C. Andrews, Stephen King, John Saul. I found the dark, mysterious, sort of scary stories to be my favorite. But I liked all sorts of stories. I really, the one rule in my house was growing up was you're allowed to keep your light on as long as you were reading. So there would be some nights when I was supposed to be asleep that I'd be up till two in the morning finishing up a book. I'm sure you've all been there. Um, but that was allowed. So people want to know, was I always a writer? Um, I wish I could say I was one of those kids that you hear about that write novels you know, in their playroom. No, I, I um, mostly wrote bad poetry featuring boys I had a crush on. Um, occasionally, my parents and I would have some sort of fight, and I would write some very angry diary entries. Um, but I can't say I was doing anything really substantial until I hit junior high and high school, and I started writing for the papers. Um, these are some of my clippings. Now, I grew up in a very small, bland town, but we dug up all the dirt we could find. And again, I found myself drawn to scandal and secrets and things you weren't supposed to know about. So we were trying to dig up as much scandal and secrets that we could in our tiny little town. And um, I really enjoyed putting these papers together. I found that I really liked writing. In fact, I almost went to journalism school. That was the closest to a professional writer I ever got. Um, but for various reasons, I, I, didn't, I got accepted into a journalism school, but the, the money wasn't there. I ended up um, having a lot of other interests. I wanted to go to art school, like my character Iris dreamed about doing. Um, I was also very interested in science and math. And it turns out, if you want scholarships, the way to go is science and math. Um, I was able to get a near full ride to Case Western Reserve University uh, because of my grades and my interest in science and math. And at the time, that made a lot of financial sense. <laughs> but college was interesting. Um, what I found is uh, studying engineering was very practical. It was very pragmatic. My father assured me that it was a great starting point for any career. I could go be a doctor. I could go be a lawyer. I could go do whatever I wanted as long as I had a good, solid technology background, technical background. I don't think he had mystery novelist in mind. <laughs> but as it turns out, he was right. Um, unfortunately for me and the artistic side of myself, uh, college did not leave, engineering school I should say, did not leave a lot of room for the arts or for writing. I did not take a single literature class or a single creative writing class in school. 
Um, I did minor in fine art. But the rest of the time, to, I don't know if you, any of you are engineers out there, but 18 credit hours a semester just to fulfill the engineering requirements. It was a very grueling curriculum. Um, so you'll notice as I'm talking about my past that there are some parallels between myself and my character, Iris Latch, who is an engineer in the book, uh, The Dead Key. I did live on Random Road in that very lovely building you see in the middle. Um, my rent in that domicile was less than $200 a month, and I was supporting myself um, at that time. But I also thought it was just fantastic to live on Random Road. <laughs> Getting out of school, I didn't really know what to expect. I don't know if you or your children have had similar experiences, but getting out of and graduating, I thought I was going to hit my career and really get to do exciting stuff. Uh, yeah, that turned out not to be true at all. Um, engineers start out on the bottom rung, and a lot of grunt work goes into building a career, as I had no idea about. But <laughs> it turns out you have to really bust your tail to move up from the bottom rung checking shop drawings, which for those of you who don't know, I sat at a desk with blueprints this big and stacked this high that diagrammed every single piece of rebar in a stadium that the the firm I was working for was working on. And it was my job to check the length, the size, the bend of every bar, and I thought I would blow my brains out after about three weeks. Um, so my first job looked a lot like this. Uh, does anyone notice a theme? This is actually a picture from the 50s, but it could have been taken from, minus the pipes, it could have been taken from my first job. Um, the, my coworkers looked like this, and I, at the time, looked more like that. And I found myself feeling like a very round peg in a very square hole. Um, I liked the work, but I felt kind of stifled. The only upside to all that nine to five, or actually eight to five, sitting at the desk, was that I finally had time to read great books. And um, I kind of took it upon myself to take a course on my own in great literature. And I read a lot of the famous titles that I wish I had read in school. And I was blown away. I went through a Herman Hess phase where I just thought I was the Steppenwolf. And then I went through a Salinger phase where I got like, you know, Franny and Zoe, I was like living with them. But um, I loved all these books. But the one thing I would say I took from them was uh, this feeling like there was a big, big difference between people who wrote like this and engineers like me. I definitely didn't feel like this was anything in my realm of capability whatsoever. I was, so it was intimidating. I, I fell in love, but I was intimidated by these books. Now, Iris Latch and I had a lot in common when I was 22, uh, but we parted ways. I really didn't like my job out of school, and neither did she. Uh, she ended up getting embroiled in a big scandal at an abandoned bank. I ended up changing jobs. So happily for me, I didn't have to get involved into a big crime ring to escape my desk. <laughs> I found through a family friend um, an opportunity to work in uh, forensic engineering and building repair. It was an entire field I had no idea existed when I was in school. And I did a lot with existing buildings. This is me outside the Quicken Loans Arena. The most important thing about repairing buildings is that I got to get away from my desk and I got to get away from the stack of drawings and I got to go drive that cool machine for a while. And I was having a blast. I got a chance to really see the city. Um, does everyone remember this incident that happened back in April? Yeah. So this was a building downtown on East 6th Street where a piece had fallen. And these pictures were taken from Cleveland.com. Um, this incident, thank goodness no one was injured, did destroy this van on the street. And you can see there, I don't know if there's, there's no pointer, but um, you can see there the top, the top of the building where that piece came from. Uh, this type of accident happens all the time. Um, if you look at cities like Chicago, Boston, Detroit, New York City, uh, even Columbus, a council member lost their leg in Columbus by a piece of building falling into the street. I had no idea that these types of accidents happen uh, when I was in school. But as it turns out, my career for a good portion of time was about preventing this type of accident. And this is a, actually a building in Cleveland, another one, many, many years ago that I worked on. Fortunately, this failure only destroyed an HVAC unit, uh, air conditioner. Um, but my job was, once something like this happened, was to make the building safe, 
without destroying all the beautiful ornament and architecture that makes us love these buildings. Um, you can see it's very difficult in the shadow, but there's rusted steel inside these buildings. Um, a lot of these buildings, like Terminal Tower, like the old um, Renaissance Hotel, and a lot of the you know, pre-war buildings downtown, including the Swetland Building where the book takes place, uh, were built taller than ever before. You know, around 1880, they started building with steel. And before that, you know the building next to Key Tower, the little stone Society for Savings building? That's about 11 stories. The walls at the base of that building are three feet thick, and they're solid stone all the way up. That's how you used to build buildings. You, could, you had to have big, big walls at the bottom, and you couldn't get very tall. Eventually, it would get unstable. When steel came along and Bethlehem and Carnegie Steel Companies came up, buildings got much, much taller, like the Terminal Tower was sprouted up, I think, 1918. Um, so you could reach the sky, but they wanted to keep the traditional look. They wanted to keep the stone look. They wanted the gar gargoyles and the cornices. So they packed the steel with all this masonry, thinking it would keep it from melting in a fire. They, they thought it was fireproofing. They just didn't realize that over time, that steel would rust and crack the masonry and things would start to fall. So this phenomenon, this sort of slow deterioration of these beautiful buildings became my life's work for about a decade. And I went up on swing stages like this one um, and rode and did an inspection on a lot of the buildings downtown. I also did buildings in Houston, I did buildings in Pittsburgh, uh, Detroit. Anytime there was a historic building, the companies I worked for specialized in keeping them safe uh, this is me going up, looking up the back of the Renaissance Hotel, the old Stouffer's Hotel that appears in the book. This is me in my harness, about to <laughs> climb over the edge of Terminal Tower. Um, here I am doing some inspection work. Uh, I felt like the Indiana Jones of engineering. I was having a blast. Um, this was not sitting behind the desk, and I was happy with that. Uh, but I got to see some amazing sights in the city of Cleveland. So, the Renaissance Hotel, the old Stouffer's Hotel, has these beautiful angels car made, molded out of terracotta clay, and this one had a broken elbow. And so one of the things that I did as my preservation work um, was first we had to diagnose the problem and then figure out how to fix it. And in the meantime, we made it safe by putting nets and straps and pins to hold the building together. Um, and this was exciting work. I got to go out to the very crow's nest of uh, Terminal Tower. This is up by the flagpole. You actually, the trap door to get up there is so tight, my boss couldn't get his knees through. So like, I got to go up there and stand at the railing, which comes to about here, and see the city. You have to remember, I grew up in a cornfield, so this was really <laughs> exciting. Um, does everyone remember this net that was around Terminal Tower for a while, a couple years back? Uh, if you remembered seeing it, um, I was the designer for that net, uh, trying to make sure that any loose pieces would be caught in the net and not fall to the street, like what happened with that van. Um, since this was taken, this photo, uh, the owner, Forest City, has invested over $20 million restoring the facade. So this was a stopgap measure, and this is what, a lot of what my work was about. It was about helping design the fix, but keeping them from tearing off. Do you see this blank spot? I want to go over and touch it. This blank spot right here used to be a beautiful porch balcony off the side of the building, but they had to remove it because it became unstable. And that's what they used to do to historic buildings. Um, the approach here, where you just try to contain it and make it safe till the repair is complete, is the more historic, sense, how historically sensitive way to handle it. So in this work I was doing as a forensic engineer um, and failure investigator, which is a detective if you think about it, um, I got to survey this building, the 1010 Euclid Avenue Swetland Building. Um, it used to be called the Swetland Building when it was first built. And it's a 15-story tower. And at the time I was there, it was about 2001. It was owned by the Jacobs Group and was part of the Ameritrust Complex. And the Ameritrust Complex had been sold off and vacated around 1991 and merged, I believe, with National City. And um, it had been the Cleveland Trust once upon a time. This, this tower is directly next door to the Cleveland Trust Rotunda. Um, Cleveland Trust went national and became Ameritrust. And then through the struggles of the savings and loan debacles and things, they struggled. And um, I did a little research on what happened to the building. But the building was vacated. And it was vacated very abruptly. And 10 years later, I walked in 
and saw the aftermath. And it's very much the way I describe in the book. Uh, there were still files in the filing cabinets. There was still trash in the trash cans. There was still a soda machine on the, in the cafeteria that was buzzing. There were dead plants on people's desks. There was a coat hanging from the back of a door. It was as though a bomb had gone off and vaporized all the people. It was a time capsule and a ghost town. And I was there to make sure that those windows didn't fall out into the street, that the corner masonry didn't crack up and fall and destroy a van or kill somebody. Um, and they were great building owners. They were very responsible. I was in and out of that building several times over the course of three years, trying to figure out ways to keep it safe and then even renovate it at one point. Because if you remember, the county was looking at this complex for a little while. Uh, but when I was there, it was empty and it was in this state. I got to go up on the upper floors where the old law offices were. I assume they were law offices because everything was very wood paneled and beautifully carved. And there was a secretarial station, a little secretarial pool in the middle surrounded by offices, like I described where my secretary Beatrice worked. And I got to sit at one of the desks and I feel like I could hear the typewriters clacking, you know, and I could hear the, the nylon swishing down the hall, and I could hear the ticking of the clocks. Like, I felt like I could hear the people, especially the ladies that had worked there. And I felt, I don't know, I just, I was kind of haunted by them when I left. Uh, this is a little view of up top, some of the cracking in the masonry that we were dealing with. Inside, we braced the corner column because it was corroded. And you can see the condition of some of the interiors that I walked through. And I did walk through by myself as an engineer. Some people have asked me that, like, were you really in a vacant building all by yourself? And um, they, they thought it wasn't believable that my character Iris would be alone where there was piles of homeless rubble, like little, little beds made out of garbage. And yes, I did see those homeless beds. And yes, I was by myself. Um, working as a female engineer in a construction field, um, I never waved the pink flag. I always said it was fine, I could handle it, and I would just kind of tiptoe past scary stuff and try to keep focused on my work. Um, while I was in the building, the caretaker, there was no security guard like I describe in the story. I love the character of Ramon, but the actual caretaker for the building, the real building, um, was the building engineers. And there was a team of about three or four that managed a lot of properties for Jacobs Group. And they were in and out of the building quite frequently. And they gave me a tour of this vault. This is the safe deposit vault that I write about. Um, this photo, by the way, is taken by a local photographer named C. Irene. She took the picture for the cover of the book. If you like the cover of the book, it was taken by a local photographer of the actual vault. She was in the vault in 2006 and took this picture. And I was so thrilled when she emailed me and wanted to get together because I hadn't seen the vault in 10 years, and actually longer. I was there in 2001 and we met last year. So it had been th you know, 13, 14 years since I'd seen it. And I wasn't there taking pictures as a tourist. I was there doing my engineering job, but I wish I had taken a picture of this vault because when the building engineer took me through and showed it to me, he told me the legend of the building. And the legend of the building was that the vault, the deposit boxes were still full, that the bank shut down so fast that they lost the keys, they lost the records, and, some, and when I was there, by the way, the doors were sealed and shut. If you look closely, I'll show you another picture. Um, a lot of these are open. But in 2001, they appeared to be closed. There were spirals of metal on the floor from a couple having been drilled open, but the vast majority that I saw were still sealed shut. And the legend, like I said, was that they were still full of someone's valuables, that, some, that something that someone left behind. And there were keys scattered on the countertop outside the vault. Um, and there was just all this, like I said, up above in the tower, all this evidence of people just leaving their things behind. So I was intrigued. And I had to walk out of this building and keep working at my job. But the mystery, this real life mystery I'd stumbled onto haunted me as I walked out along with like the footsteps and the voices of the echoes I felt like I could hear inside. So I felt like I was haunted by the building. But I went about my job and my life, and this happened a couple of years later, and then pretty soon that happened, <laughs> and then that happened, and I had my hands full. So over the course of 10 years, I went from hating my job to getting to survey all these great buildings, to getting married and having a family, and then the worst possible thing happened. I got promoted. 
And the minute I got promoted, I was taken out of the field. And I wasn't able to go do my Indiana Jones thing as much anymore. Has anyone ever been promoted out of a job they loved? <laughs> that ever happened to anyone? In engineering, I've heard it called the Peter Principle, that you get elevated a level above where you'd actually like to be. Um, I found that juggling family and trying to manage young engineers uh, was not working for me or my family. And uh, for many reasons, I quit my job. And I had had a job since I was 16 years old. And I had supported myself through college. I'd supported my husband while he built his business. I had always had a job. And not having one felt like this. It felt like falling down an elevator shaft. Um, this is actually a view through scaffolding. But it was just one of the scariest moments of my life. And I got home with my six-month-old baby and my three-year-old toddler. And I found out pretty darn quick that I am a lousy stay-at-home mom. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really not great at it. You'll never find my cupcakes on Pinterest, <laughs> ever. I'm not home making anything. And my children are wonderful and I love them dearly. And frankly, I'm amazed and in awe of all the moms that do that job and do it well. Um, I kind of just muddled through and my husband would come home and I'd had like, you know, punched a hole through the wall because I wanted to see what was behind it or I dug up a hole in the backyard because I wanted a project. I was very restless and um, within a few weeks I started to kind of in my back of my brain, the little beginnings of this book that I had been dreaming about for 10 years started to pop up. So in 2010 I sat down and thought about writing this book. and. Like a good engineer, I had to do some research first. So I read a bunch of books on how to be a writer because I had no idea. I mean, I'm sure you guys know that engineers are known for being wonderfully creative, great communicators, <laughs> fabulous writers. You know, you know that about us, right? So I did some research, and I like to put these two books up um, for anyone out there who's interested in writing at all. Um, there's another book I recommend at the end, but uh, No Plot, No Problem is the cheesiest book you'll ever see, but it was the exact thing I needed at the time. Um, does anyone know what National Write a Novel Month is? Because it's starting. It's starting next this Sunday. Every November, there's a group of folks. They started in Seattle, but they've gone worldwide, and they set out to write a novel in a month. And they set a word count limit, like you're supposed to hit 1,500 words a day. That's your minimum. And if you do that for 30 days, you will end up with about a 200-page novel. And I thought, OK, I could do this. And my husband and I tried it um, in 2009 and failed miserably. Like, I think we got to the day four. But I picked up the book finally, and I knew about the movement. Um, and the book really gave me the courage to stop editing. Because the biggest mistake any writer will make is to sit down and say, OK, I'm going to write like Salinger writes. I'm just going to write something great. And until the great words come, I'm going to sit here. So obviously, that's a great way to go. But um, for me, I needed the permission to just write a bunch of garbage because I didn't know what I was doing. And this book really sets out some basic things. So you don't, I don't edit when I'm drafting. Like I just let it go. And that was great, because I had two hours every day where my little baby was sleeping and my toddler was at preschool. And for two hours every day, I tried to write 1,500 words based on that limit and just the general idea of it. And so I got, that was about a chapter a day. For those of you who read the book, you'll notice that all my chapters are about five pages long. It's about the right amount of time. It takes about two hours to do that for me. And I did that for eight months. And at the end of eight months, I had 600 pages. And 600 steaming, nasty, messy, horrible pages. But I had them. And um, writing was kind of like this for me. It was like, this is actually a picture from an arson that I took from my regular job. And um, it's really a, just a god awful mess when you start out. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. I read a lot. I love stories. I love movies. I love all kinds of things. So I was like, well, I'll just try to write something I want to read, which apparently is not that bad of a way to go. Um, but it does feel like you're wandering around in the dark. I was lucky. I had a little bit of light. Like My husband read my chapters and actually liked them. He said to me, you know what, honey, this doesn't totally suck. <laughs> I think. 
I want to know what happens next. Will you give me more? And if he hadn't said those words, I probably would have done what I did the year before, which is get two chapters in and give up and, you know, go dig a hole in the backyard again. Um, what was great was at the end, I did feel like I had a picture, like a story formed. Now, it wasn't perfect, but hopefully it was a keyhole into this world that I was seeing. And when I would quiz my husband, I'm like, so did you get that part? Did that make sense? And like, he could kind of see what I was trying to say. That was a wonderful moment. And so this is the first draft of the dead key. <laughs> Do you like the cover? Isn't that nice? My husband made that, the Jerry Garcia holding a key. And um, I just felt so proud for this massive mess I had made. And I didn't really know what to do. I, um, my poor book club friends were forced to read it. To this day, I feel bad for them. Um, I went through four years of editing, to tell you the truth. I, I did many, many drafts. Um, and I learned a whole bunch about mystery thrillers. I didn't even know that's what I had written. When I was done, I was just like, ta-da! And it's about women and work and banks and history and I have no idea what it is. So I went online, I took a quiz to see what kind of book it was, because you can't get an agent unless you know what kind of book you have, <laughs> apparently. Apparently that's important. They're like, they want to know where to put it in the bookstore. So I was like, okay, so I took a quiz, and I was like, so does it have women? Yes, it has women. Um, is there guns? Yeah, there's guns. Uh, does someone die? Yes. Okay, so it's a mystery thriller. That's how I found out, and I was like, well, I better figure out what makes a good mystery thriller. I'd read them but not like as a student. I just read them for fun. So um, these are some of the mystery thrillers that I read when I was trying to really understand my genre. These are the ones that stood out and that I really enjoyed. If you want any of these titles, I'm happy to repeat them for you at the end of the show. But um, a couple local authors I just want to point out because they were a huge inspiration and help to me. I've actually met these people. Sam Thomas, is a wonderful man. He teaches at university school. His midwife series um, is all very well researched. He's a PhD. He puts my historical fiction to shame, and he's been a great colleague for me. So he was a big help. Dan Sean, Await Your Reply, um, is another book I like to point out. It's a literary thriller, which means he's fancy, and his <laughs> writing is much better than mine. But he's um, a professor at Oberlin, and this book was such a mind-blowing experience for me. I actually stalked him all the way to Indiana to take his <laughs> workshop this summer, and he was great. I really learned a lot from him. And of course, if you're going to write a mystery, you have to read Daphne du Maurier. If you guys have not read Rebecca, I insist you go do it immediately. It's a great book, and it's actually, to me, the gold standard. It's the most beautifully written piece of literature but also genre fiction. And there's a big debate out there between genre fiction and literature. And it's wonderful when you find a book that spans the categories because it's, it's just timeless. Um, so I had my book and I had revised it and revised it and revised it. And um, I was convinced that an agent would call. I send out my, my queries and heard nothing but crickets, nothing. Uh, BoucherCon came to Cleveland in 2012. Does anyone here know what the heck BoucherCon is? It sounds like a disease. Does anyone know? It's a conference for mystery writers. Boucher was a big mystery critic, and the, the conference meets every year. I was just there in Raleigh a couple weeks ago, and it never comes to Cleveland. It, has, it had never come to Cleveland in like 75 years, and it finally came to Cleveland, and obviously it came for me. I mean, there was no... There was no question about that. Like there was no reason, fate-wise, why it would come to Cleveland and in 2012 when I had a like a fourth draft, other than for me to find an agent and for my whole all my dreams to come true. So I went to BoucherCon with high hopes, and I had lunches and I met authors and I talked to people and um, a lovely gentleman who writes pet cozies where the Chihuahua solves the mystery, <laughs> gave me some very valuable vocational advice and he said. These, I think, were his words. Um, nobody's going to call you if your book's longer than 100,000 words. Because as a first-time author in a genre, 300 pages is like your cap. Anything more than that, they kind of think you're self-indulgent or don't know what you're doing or whatever. And my book at the time was 153. So I packed up with the lovely advice. He also talked to me about my elevator pitch. And he was a very, very nice gentleman, an person. He wrote Pet Cozies, 
and porn online under a different name. <laughs> Oddly enough. And um, so I got home from BoucherCon after meeting like some stars, like Mary Higgins Clark was there, Karen Slaughter was there. I got to hear them speak and um, meet all kinds of authors. And I got home and I climbed under my bed and I decided just to give up. Like I wanted to set the book on fire. I was like, you know, four years of my life. Well, at that point in time, it had been two and a half. Um, I just was. I just decided there's just no way. I couldn't separate my two characters. And those of you who've read the book know that I tell a long story because I tell two stories. I tell the story of Iris, an engineer, sort of like me, um, in 1998 going through an abandoned building. And then I tell the story of Beatrice, a secretary working inside the building in 1978, right before it shuts down. And both women are trying to solve the same mystery. Both women are trying to find out what went wrong in the bank and what's going on in the safe deposit vault. Why are there so many mysteries locked up in this building? And they kind of solve the crime together and by going back and forth in time between them. And what I really loved about having them together, because you know, the logical thing is you have a 600 page book, you separate it into two. I was like, well, I could tell the Iris book, and then I could go tell the Beatrice book. And I tried to separate them. I did. I have like a version of that on my computer. But all the fun life that went on between the two characters, all the back and forth, and frankly, Iris, without Beatrice there as a ghost that she's sort of chasing through the building, just doesn't make sense to me. And so the whole story kind of died on the page. And I just also died a terrible, depressed death. And, um, I was going to give up. I, I actually, I read Stephen King's on writing. I'm going to throw that up here in a little bit. But I was like, you know, a writer, a novelist, does not start by writing a giant tome of a book. That's just not what you do. You start by writing short stories and essays. You start by getting into magazines. You start by getting your short stories into collections. Like, that's the traditional way to go. And so I told myself to just, you know, get off my little high horse and just come down to earth and let's just put the book aside. And I went online to find contests, like some sort of where to send in an essay, like what to do with a short story, hoping to find some way to get published in a smaller form. And I came across my second Google hit, my first or second, was the Amazon Breakthrough Novel Award. And I locked on the, um, the contest requirements because the word count limit was 125,000 words. And I was at 153. And that was it. I was like, well, okay, that's probably the best I'm ever going to get as far as a word length limit. So I took three weeks, I cut 100 pages out of the book, and I just threw the, the book into the contest. Just kind of like a Hail Mary, like I was just sort of punting it. And then I was like, all right, that's, the, you know, maybe someday I'll do something. The idea was, well, maybe I'll self-publish. And I started coming to library seminars and workshops on how to self-publish, what are the steps. And this contest, the big benefit besides the word length was that Am um, Publishers Weekly was going to read the books. Um, There's 10,000 entries, but the top 500 would all get read by Publishers Weekly and you would get a blurb, like a, something where I could say, quote, Publishers Weekly says, quote, dot, 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 book, dot, 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 interesting, dot, 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 fun, or, you know, something. I would just take out all the bad stuff and just say that. <laughs> and. <laughs> And then maybe if I self-published, more than five people that all know my mom would buy the book. Like maybe I would sell 10. So I, that was the whole plan. And um, the first round of the contest, the reason why this is up here, uh, was because there's 10,000 entries, they don't read all 10,000. You give them 250 words. And based on your pitch, this was my pitch for the book, um, they, they go from 10,000 down to 2,000. And so, the first round was the hardest cut. I mean, they got rid of 80% of the entries. And um, when the results came out six weeks later, my husband and I were sitting there reading down the list, and he couldn't find my name on the list. Most people get cut at the pitch round. And as I found out, there's discussion boards. Like, there's a whole culture around this contest. And um, when he couldn't find my name, like, we had a beer. We're like, it was a good run. I guess it was a stupid idea. You know, we're just drinking. He's like, let me check one more time. So he, like, went through and looked by first name instead of last name and found me. And so for a minute there, we were out. Um, and really, <laughs> it was really just a shot in the dark, I have to tell you. Um, nobody was more shocked than me when we won. And uh, we entered in February, and we found out a year ago, it was a year at the end of July, um, so that we won the contest. And 
I was thinking, well, first of all, I couldn't believe it. I think I fell to my knees and cried like a crazy person for a little while. And then I drank like a crazy person for a little while. And then I kind of came to. But I was like, OK, great. So this book is going to come out. It'll be all great now. And as it turns out, oh, this kind of got cut off. Um, Hunter S. Thompson was right. Luck is kind of a line between disaster <laughs> and survival. And I found out that I had to do a bunch of editing. And I, all my friends were like, what you want? And that's what I tried to say, but they didn't listen to me. I had to do a bunch of editing. And um, so I learned a lot of stuff. I learned that engineering does not really teach you much about grammar <laughs> or structure or dangling participles or where to put a comma. My commas are always out of place. I love this cartoon because I still don't know where to put a comma. I'm always confused. Um, I mostly like to leave them out, which my copy editor did not appreciate. Um, yes, and my participles were dangling terribly. I was embarrassed. It was a very humbling thing to be edited professionally, I'll just have you know. But I learned a ton. And then there were some larger issues that we had to work out. And some people want to know, like, what did they want to change in the story? Like, what were the big issues? Um, they wanted me to make Iris more likable and smarter and making better decisions all the time and plucky and, and smarter than everyone else in the room. And, and I was like, but Angela Lansbury already has a job and I can't, <laughs> she doesn't fit into my story. So we did have a lot of arguments about how Iris is a frustrating character. She sometimes gets drunk. She sometimes makes horrible decisions. She has a potty mouth, I'm sorry. Um, but we, we worked through that. We tried to make her more relatable. So those of you who find Iris a little bit irritating, you're welcome. <laughs> that, was all, that was all my idea. Um, also, they wanted the ending to be a little bit more full. There was no epilogue before. And thank goodness that they encouraged me to pursue the ending a little bit more, because I, I am really pleased with how it ended up. That book definitely got better through the process, but it was a long process. So finally, the day came where a box showed up with these. I think my mom's got like 12 under her bed. <laughs> and we're all so happy. Um, I, besides being lucky just to have won the contest, the, the, so the karmic debt I owe the universe is enormous. Because not only was the book picked up, but the building that inspired the book was renovated the same year. Um, the empty Ameritrust complex got bought up in 2013 by Geis Brothers, and they turned the vault that inspired my story into a nightclub called Vault. Here are some pictures of it. This is the beautiful down here in this lower corner. That's the Cleveland Trust Rotunda, the beautiful glass ceiling. I've heard that Tiffany style glass ceiling valued at over $20 million. You really ought to get down there to see all of the hand-painted murals, to see what they did, turning it into a Heinen's. It's just amazing. We had the book launch party at the vault that inspired the story. And both my parents were there, and we had a blast. Um, so just be careful when you come near me, because I'm probably now a dark cloud of bad luck, now that all the good luck has been used up. Um, so people want to know uh, about my next project. I do have a second book that um, is into my publisher right now, so everyone keep your fingers crossed. It's very different. Uh, my third book I'm working on now is based in Cleveland, but this second one is a very personal project, and it centers around um, the Beecher Flint tornado that hit in 1953, it ripped through Michigan. It was the most deadly tornado, most destructive tornado on record. and it obviously altered so many lives, but it also centers um, in a conflict between my characters and this book that I've written. Um, it's inspired by real events and real people, and it's a story of a boy who's abandoned by his mother on a farm. And um, so I'm hoping they pick it up, but I had to write the story now. The innocent and guilty are still with us, many of them, so I've taken a lot of personal interviews. And I also have a nine-year-old boy that um, is sort of the basis of the character. So I'll wrap up with just a little plug for Stephen King's On Writing. For those of you who are here because you're interested in writing or they want to know more about the writing process, I'm happy to answer your questions in just a moment. But I do recommend that any writer or anyone that's just a fan of writers read this book by Stephen King. Every single novelist that I've met in person has this book on their shelf. It is truly a gold standard of how to write and how to continue to write well. So I, I can't say enough nice things about it. 
Um, so I'm happy to answer your questions. I feel like I talked a really long time. You guys were very patient. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yeah. I just I have to just say you are an excellent speaker. Aww. I never expected you know any of this, and I read the book, but now I want to read it again because there was so much in it, you know, and then going back and forth between the characters and so forth, and now that you've really explained it, I'm going to read it. Again. Oh, I'm glad. I hope you enjoy it the second time around. If, for those of you who've read it, did anyone go back and read the prologue after you had finished? Can I show of hands? Yes. <laughs> That's good. That was intended. That was wonderful. Um, yes. No, I had a question. Yeah. Um, she, Beatrice finds out that Doris has been going to her box on a weekly. Yes. You know, um, to, she thought to deposit her tips. Which right. I, I mean, what is there a reasoning? for a Doris going there weekly to her vault. Well, the idea, okay, this is a little bit of a spoiler alert, but one of the characters is in and out of the vault quite frequently, and she's there under false pretenses. She's there to actually orchestrate more than just regular deposits into her box. She's actually using her knowledge of the bank and the vault to manipulate deposits. And um, so she's sort of an inside man, if that makes sense. Um, so she's working with the other characters. Yes, 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 yes. She's, she's the one that's kind of orchestrating a lot of the, the malfeasance there inside. Um, one question I get all the time uh, is what's really, what was really inside those boxes, right? Which I still want to know. I will tell you, um, I went there during the renovation a year ago, and I met with the developer because I was terrified that the truth was a heck of a lot more interesting than the stuff I made up. And I wanted to find out like what was really the truth. What they told me, Geist Brothers took possession in 2013 and all the boxes were standing open and empty. That's what they said. Um, now in 2006, when the photographer who took this beautiful picture, again, another plug for C. Irene because she's amazing. She goes to the Cleveland Flea, she goes to the art festivals, she takes great urban landscapes of Cleveland. And if you're a Cleveland fan, I highly recommend you check out her work. Um, but when she was there taking this photo and the others you saw of the vault, some were standing open and that was in 2006. Uh, in 2001, when it was still held by Jacob's group, um, I believe the boxes were shut. In between 2001 and 2006, a lot of things happened inside the building, actually. Um, ownership transfer. The county was very interested in developing it into the county headquarters. A gentleman named Jimmy DeMora was, um, this is according to the records I read, he was involved in some of the asbestos abatement contracts. I believe one of the indictments against him was for fixing the asbestos abatement contract or a kickback or something. I don't know if that was actually proven, but I know that that was one of the things that, that was listed, um, I think, on his indictments. And um, so there was a lot of contractors. There were a lot of workers in and out of the building. And I've since, I've published the book and have been meeting with lovely groups like this. I've met a few folks who worked in the vault or worked in the bank. One gentleman in particular, I met at Baldwin Wallace during a luncheon who um, was involved in audits uh, during the sale or surrounding the sale. And he um, has assured me that the contents should have been turned over to the state. And I totally, I'm like, okay, that's absolutely great. Do you, do you know what happened? And then he, he gave me kind of a hypothetical, like, well, have you considered that maybe the belongings were emptied and the keys were returned and the boxes were just shut afterwards? And I'm like, that's a great theory. That could have happened. But he didn't say it for sure. It was kind of left hanging. And I asked him if he wanted, if, he, if I could contact him for more information. And he kind of, he's retired. He was like, no, no, I'm going to step back. Um, so right now it's still a mystery and um, one theory that's also come up I've kind of thought up is uh, you know the vault itself was built around 1918 it was a very, well actually I think the, the, the rotunda was 1908 so it was a very old vault and you know through the depression and all the different ownership transfers over the years it's possible that some deposits went dormant and nobody made a claim. And if there wasn't a demand for that box, it wasn't like the bank was required to drill it open by law. It's just you can't drill it open by law for five years. Once five years has passed, a bank has the right to empty out a box and repurpose it. 
Um, but I don't think they're required to. So I like to think that there were some deposits there that had been sitting there since the 30s. Um, but the truth, I don't know, if anyone in the audience has information, I would love to talk with you after. Because <laughs> we're still looking for the truth. But I, from, from my perspective, I kind of like that it's still a mystery because the idea of the unknown is um, more interesting to me. But, uh, but I'm sure someone out there knows it, what really happened. OK, um, yes? I know you were talking about the tunnels under the buildings. And I know I saw something on television one time that there are a lot of tunnels. Yeah. Did you get to go into any of those when you were? Yes. Um, there are several tunnels that connect the three buildings in the complex. Uh, the Ameritrust Tower, which was built in the 70s, it's like the Bauhaus tower that's now the Metropolitan Nine Hotel and the Cleveland Trust Rotunda and the Sweatland building were all connected under the street. Um, there's a part of vault, the nightclub, where you're inside uh, a private party room but you're actually standing under the clock at East 9th and Euclid. So, and, the, and they were vaulted brick tunnels that went under the sidewalk and connected between them. Um, but it, to answer your broader question, yes, there are utility tunnels that connect many buildings downtown. I did not map them. My description of the tunnels that I use was based on um, what I experienced within the area of the building. And I also did survey work at University of Akron through their utility tunnel system. And that's a very large system connecting an entire campus. And it's all underground with little access points that you get down. Case Western also has a steam tunnel system that students used to be able to use to get into class when it was cold and snowing out. I believe there was some sort of assault in those tunnels at some point because they were sealed. But um, so these types of tunnels are not unheard of, especially in older cities. It's quite common. And even brand new construction, they do have to tunnel in to bring in things like internet, power, water. You know, like there are usually connections like that. So, but it was inspired by my real life experience, but I didn't actually get to map the exact location. So I did use fiction there. So thanks. Yes. So you don't have any plans to tie up the, the like Iris, Max, Beatrice at the end? <laughs> well, I like the idea um, of visiting them again sometime down the road. I didn't design the book to be part of a series. That wasn't the intent. Um, and I like to think that what happens to them next, it's, it's not something I could tie up easily with a bow. Like, oh, and they all just go to the beach and drink margaritas together. Like, I think that they all have go their separate ways and have very interesting stories. I would love to explore what happens to Max. I think she's one of the more interesting characters. She's, by the way, for those of you who haven't read the story, Maxine McDonald is this um, jaded, very kind of veteran secretary that takes Beatrice under her wing. Beatrice is a new, very young girl who's just starting to learn the ropes at the bank. And Maxine is the one that the, the chain smoking, kind of smart talking secretary that tells her some of the truth behind the bank. And, um, I love the character of Max. I think that she's one of the more interesting characters in the book, and I would love to follow up with where she ends up. But um, unfortunately, as I already told you, the book is too long <laughs> as it is. Um, and Max deserves her own story if, she's gonna, if I'm going to go there. It's not something, um, well, in the more complicated answer to that is people want to know, do I know what happens ahead of time? Or do I figure it out as I'm writing? Like, like, do you plot ahead of time or do you pants it, is what they call it in the writing business, when you go by the seat of your pants and just, so you're either a plotter or you're a pantser. And um, I wrote the story not knowing what was going to happen next. Um, that kind of helped me keep going chapter to chapter. I would leave myself on a cliffhanger so that I would have to start writing again the next day to find out what happened. And I honestly wanted to know. I wanted to know the answer to the question, what is in that vault? Like that was the question that drove me to keep writing. And so that was sort of my process was not knowing. So right now, if you ask me what happened to Max, I've got ideas, but until I were to sit down and write her what happens next, I wouldn't be able to tell you for sure. Um, I liked that I tried to give hope to all my characters at the end. Um, I tried to make sure that my two main characters, Iris, Iris and Beatrice, ended up stronger and more prepared to deal with what was going to happen next. It's almost to the point where if they're, you know, if they've matured to a point where they're going to be okay on their own, which I hope for them, I don't know that they're that exciting to 
watch anymore. You know, like I'm kind of hoping that they move on to something healthy and happy, and that's not great fiction. <laughs> I can tell you, healthy and happy is kind of boring, and that's why I have to write fiction. Uh, because, you know, boredom's great. It means everyone's fine. But it's not necessarily a great story. But Maxine, I think, has a lot of drama. And I also think Doris, the um, character you don't really get to know because so much happens before, she's another character I would love to, to meet up with again. Um, so we'll see. That's, I, that's definitely a possibility in the future. Yes? What made you decide to um, deal with Max's brother the way he did? Yeah. Uh -huh. Aha. <laughs> well, that was another point. Thank you for being vague. Um, yeah, no, uh, the detective, Tony, who um, is a great character, loved him. My mother will never forgive me <laughs> for what happens to him. Um, but it was something where, um, you know, talks of feminism kind of come up sometimes when I discuss my book. And one of the things that I wanted for my character, Iris, is I wanted her to have to save herself. And I felt very strongly about that, I've, and just as, from a philosophical standpoint, but also from a dramatic standpoint, I kind of, as a, as a consumer, as a, someone, a reader, I don't like it when, you know, there's no actual consequences to things that happen in a story. I'm kind of tired of these fist fights that just like go on and on and out the door and nobody ever really gets hurt. I'm, I'm tired of gun battles where everybody always walks away. You know, there's, um, there's a great fight scene in Officer and a Gentleman where Louis Gossett Jr. and Richard Gere are fighting and it looks like it hurts and like they only exchange a few blows but like they all are painful. And so for me, I didn't want to have um, a lot of empty violence where there were no consequences. That was another part of that decision. But I also wanted to raise the stakes for you, the reader, and for all my characters. Like, I think that um, it's not, it's not a, a light issue, like when, when a gun or, or you know, a potential violence occurs. Like, I, I don't know that I would want to treat it lightly. So for me, it was, it was a, a moment of heavy consequence for everyone. And it's sad, you know, like you want all your characters to live happily ever after, but uh, he made a fatal mistake, <laughs> I would say. And I could talk to you more about it after, maybe without giving away, yes? Did you ever see the plans for the Cleveland Trust Tower? They were, there was actually a twin building on the Euclid side, and it was to encircle the uh, rotunda. And, uh, interesting they were you know that was an original plan so it and the original renovation plans you mean all oh, the original construction plans you know um i've seen a lot of different urban plans for cleveland over the years but i don't know that i'm familiar with that exact one when they built the building, it, was to be it was supposed to be more than yeah oh i believe it because it kind of looks unfinished the way it was off to the side um, i imagine the great depression or something like that was on Maybe that was kind of behind it. Do you know the timing? Because I think the Sweatland building was built in the 20s. Well, I mean, in the 70s, the idea was. Oh, it was the 70s idea that they were going to tear down the Sweatland building? Oh. Well, I'm glad they didn't. You were talking about <laughs> tunnels. Did you ever hear about the tunnel across, across um, Huron and Prospect, where Clinton Trust built a garage, but there was a public um, bookstore, and it was like a catacomb that you could go almost all the way across to to the, the north side of the intersection and it was it was incredible you could go oh my gosh there was a bookstore that connected that across Huron four and a half five feet high at the ceilings and it was full of books and it was really and it was dim and dark and dusty but it was that sounds like an ideal bookstore in the dark and dusty covered in cobwebs and right under there oh yeah I wish I would have seen that because I saw some of the empty, what was left. Do you know what year that was? That bookstore was there connecting the rotunda to Cross Huron? It was, um, it, it was torn down sometime in the early 70s. In the early 70s, okay. There was a big controversy because Cleveland Trust wanted that space and they wanted a parking garage. And oh, I see. The landmark in the whole northeastern Ohio area was this bookstore. Well, in the 70s was a tough time for historic buildings. Like, you know, that whole urban renewal program that I mentioned in the story, a lot of historic buildings were destroyed thinking progress, thinking new construction would bring new jobs, new life, better downtown. Um, the Huff riots that I describe in the book were 
directly linked, um, according to many accounts, to them clearing land for new construction that never came. And um, so it was a rough time for historic places like the bookstore you describe. It really was. I think that people wanted, I don't know, a salve for some of the decline, the industrial decline that places like Cleveland were experiencing. Um, a lot of buildings were vacant in 94 when I first came. And it's so exciting to see what's happened to the city since then. So I really hope you all get a chance to go downtown and see what they've done to that space and others. It's just the downtown area is transforming. And it's great. Um, did anyone go to the theatrical that, were, that was here? Been You've been there? I hear from a lot of readers that, yeah, the theatrical was the place to be. My favorite story that I heard from a reader was that if you sat at a certain table at the theatrical grill, you might get propositioned as a prostitute. Like, you had to be very careful about where you sat. And famously, gangsters and mayors and musicians all would gather in this one place. And it's another place I had to research because it was before my time, um, which kind of bums me out because it sounds like a really fun, fun place. Yeah. So it, can I get one more question? Does anyone have? OK, in the back. A technical question. Uh, in the last few decades, or a few decades before 2000, Dow Chemical developed an additive to help cure concrete. Okay. And it was called Cerebond. Yes, I know about Cerebond. And my question is, did you ever in your, whether it be related to this book or to your work as a forensic engineer, ever run across it? Because I know there were some building owners in Cleveland that yes. sued Dow over that. Yeah, the question is, um, there was a chemical additive that used to be put into concrete and mortar for bricks, and it was supposed to make the mortar stronger, because um, that's the weak point in a brick wall, is where the mortar would just break and crack away. If you're loving historic buildings, you want that to happen. You don't want your mortar to stay and your stone and beautiful stuff to flake off. Um, but so the question was, did I ever come across a Sarabon case or a Sarabon problem? Yeah, there were a couple buildings in downtown Cleveland that got this mortar additive put in. And it, what it was, it was high in chloride ions, I believe. It became very corrosive to the steel. And nobody kind of thought ahead to the long term, 20, 10, 20 years later, like how the metal ties that hold brick back or all the things that hold it into place would start rusting at a very accelerated rate. And so there were many lawsuits. And there were two buildings, Crittenden Court and I think the Crown Plaza Hotel, that I was personally involved in that had that issue. And they had since been reclad. So, um, so forensic engineering can involve stuff like that as well. And it's also a lot of water leakage. There's a lot of fun, exciting stuff. Right now, lately, I've, I've just did a house where a tree fell on the house. And so I'm working for the insurance company to find out if the house is salvageable. I've done a couple arson cases. Um, so that's the type of work I do now. Uh, but thank you so much for all the questions. And I really appreciated meeting you all. So I understand that we're going to adjourn to the rotunda. How appropriate, to the rotunda. So now I noticed you're taking notes about the how to write book. Are you a writer? I am. I have a children's picture book out and I'm writing a writing. Oh, me too. And so, you know, I, I take what you write and I tone it down a little bit. For a younger audience. I love That's it. Right. Well, good luck to Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll look for your stuff. Amazon. Achoo. Achoo? It's all over. Okay, okay. wonderful.
thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the adult program series for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.